Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome back to episode number 184 of the Healthy Skin Show. In today's episode, I wanna talk about whether collagen is a supplement you should consider on your skin rash journey. I've personally used collagen for several years in my own regimen, and even my husband takes it daily to help with joint health since he pretty much wrecked his knees and shoulders as a teen from lots of skateboarding. And the suggestion that he do so is based on some research that I've read that shows that it may be helpful for those with joint issues. From a skin perspective, I do think collagen is important. And we know that the use of topical steroids thins the skin and impacts your body's collagen production. And that might be why I get asked quite frequently if collagen supplements could be helpful. And the answer depends on a few factors. While generally the answer is yes, there are some downsides that make it a no-go for certain individuals. I'll dive into more on that in a few moments so you can decide for yourself if collagen is a good fit for your protocol. First, let's talk about what collagen is and where it's found. So collagen makes up 30% of the protein in your body. It's a combination of several amino acids, including glycine, proline, hydroxyproline, and arginine. There are different types of collagen, believe it or not. The ones most helpful for skin, gut, and joint health are types one and three. And in order for your body to even make collagen, because we do actually make collagen, you have to have these amino acids available along with vitamin C since it's a critical cofactor. So if you have low vitamin C levels, making collagen is definitely gonna be a problem. Dietary sources of collagen include bone broth, gelatin, collagen peptide supplements, bone marrow, and canned salmon with the skin and bones. Yes, I just said the cans that also contain the skin and bones. Get that instead of the one without it because that canned salmon is much more nutritious and don't worry, the skin and bones easily disintegrate when you mix them up so you will not choke on or get stabbed by a bone in there because it's totally soft because it's been cooked. Collagen peptide supplements, by the way. Now collagen peptide supplements are derived from cow, chicken, or fish, also called marine, sources. When purchasing a collagen peptide supplement, sourcing is crucial. You wanna look for grass-fed, pasture-raised land animals, and fish should be from wild-caught sources. The reason is that collagen is derived from the skin, connective tissue, and bones, which can harbor heavy metals and pollutants from inferior animal and fish sources. Now you might ask me, but Jen, Aren't there any vegan collagen sources? I didn't hear any of those on your list. So to be clear, there is no such thing as vegan collagen. Collagen is not made in plants, which is why the list I've just shared doesn't offer up any plant-based options. Vegan collagen supplements do not contain any collagen. They only contain the various nutrients that make up collagen. This brings up an important point. Any articles that recommend plant-based food sources as being collagen rich are inaccurate and misleading. Now look, I love plant-based foods. I have a garden. I cook lots of plant foods and vegetables and fruits and all sorts of things, but I have to be honest here. These articles are highly confusing, leading people to think that they're potentially eating collagen in a plant-based food because it contains a single nutrient the body needs to make collagen. In reality, these sources should never be described as collagen rich since they literally contain no collagen. Now, one final point about collagen. Any collagen peptide supplement isn't absorbed as collagen itself. Your body breaks down collagen into the smallest units of amino acids to use as it sees fit. So there's no guarantee in taking collagen peptides, drinking bone broth, or even a vegan collagen product that the nutrients will ultimately go towards increasing collagen production in your body. And that may be especially true if there's a greater need for the nutrients elsewhere. 
One issue that impacts our community is the use of topical steroids. And we know that they actually do thin your skin because they decrease collagen production. Other forms of steroids may also play a role in reduced collagen production, and those include steroid inhalers, nasal sprays, and oral medications. So you really should factor in your total steroid exposure. And thin skin is a huge frustration by many in our community, as I've mentioned. So can collagen supplements potentially increase collagen production in those who've developed thin skin? Now, research does show some promise in improving skin thickness in healthy individuals. But I was not able to find any research looking at the use of collagen supplementation in those with thinned skin due to topical steroid exposure. So the jury's still out on that. Now there's another question here. What about the use of topical collagen? There are topical products with added collagen on the market. Could they be helpful to improve collagen in the skin? And can topical collagen even be absorbed through the skin? For this answer, I turn to a friend of the Healthy Skin Show. You know her. Her name's Rachel Pontillo, and she is an expert in skincare ingredients and formulation. Rachel shared that, quote, applying collagen topically in cosmetics, such as serums, creams, lotions, and masks, with the intention of increasing collagen production in the skin, is not nearly as effective as the product companies that market, quote unquote, anti-aging collagen cosmetics would have you believe. The first main reason is that cosmetics can only affect the epidermal layers of the skin. Collagen, however, is formed by cells called fibroblasts that are located in the reticular dermis, which is in the deeper of the two layers of the dermis. And this is where cosmetics and aesthetic treatments do not have the ability to reach. Aside from that, collagen itself is too large of a molecule to penetrate through the epidermis, even when it's broken down by hydrolysis. And even if it were to penetrate, there's no evidence to show dermal bioavailability. For these reasons, the best way to support healthy collagen production for cosmetic purposes is to make sure that enough of the micronutrients, including amino acids, vitamin C, etc., are available from the blood through diet and supplementation, end quote. Now that said, there may be a therapeutic use in medical practice for topical collagen and wound healing, but that is not the same as using cosmetic products that contain collagen. If you're wondering about ways to add collagen to your diet, let's talk about this. So I typically recommend daily protein intake should be between 70 to 80 grams per day if you're struggling with chronic skin rashes or chronic health problems. And I've actually talked about this before on the Healthy Skin Show to help you better understand the reasoning behind that. Collagen supplementation can be helpful in achieving this daily protein goal, but collagen cannot and should not ever be used alone to make up the bulk of your protein intake. So if your daily protein intake is really low, let's just say it's around 20 grams, you can't make up that 50 to 60 grams with collagen alone. And the reason is that collagen isn't a complete protein source, meaning that it doesn't have a complete spectrum of amino acids that your body needs to thrive. Because remember, we are not a nutrient production factory. We are a nutrient consumption factory factory. Now, I typically recommend collagen being used between 10 to 15 grams per day to my clients based on what appears to be effective in research. This means that a powder form of collagen or even something like collagen peptides will likely offer more benefits than what can be minimally packed into a pill. Plus, it's super easy to add to your daily diet. Here are some creative ideas. Collagen peptides can be dissolved completely in both hot and cold liquids without altering the consistency of the beverage. So you can add them to things like coffee or tea or juice, lots of other things. Again, hot or cold beverages work just fine. You can also add collagen to baked goods to help increase protein content. As a personal example, I add two to three scoops of collagen to gluten-free pancake mix, you know, when I make pancakes like maybe once a month. 
I also add it to protein shakes to increase total protein intake. That helps me hit my daily protein targets. I add a scoop to my oatmeal before cooking it. You can also add it into yogurt. It doesn't matter whether it's vegan or it comes from um, animal sources like cow or goat's milk. You can add it to pudding. You can add it to applesauce. So you can really get it in in almost anything. You can also add it to store-bought boxed broths or broth made from bouillon cubes. For this option, since it's hot, you might even just actually add gelatin instead as long as you heat it up. You have to add gelatin powder to hot items. Items. Don't add it to cold or it'll get clumpy. And you can also add it to lattes, hot cocoa, or mochas. So when I make a golden latte, or maybe you love to make matcha lattes, add a scoop of collagen right into it. As you can see, collagen peptides are incredibly versatile. Most collagen peptide powders are completely tasteless, including those made from bovine and marine sources, unless the company has made a product with a specific added flavor. The personal brands that I use and recommend are from Vital Proteins, Great Lakes Gelatin, yes, they specifically do make a collagen product, and the collagen from Thrive Market. While collagen is generally helpful, there are certain instances when supplementing collagen might not be a good idea. The first is if you struggle with kidney disease and you've been advised to limit protein intake by your doctor. Secondly, if you have an alpha-gal allergy, which is an allergy to mammalian protein, you'd need to limit your collagen, gelatin, and protein sources to chicken or fowl and marine sources. And finally, collagen supplements would be contraindicated for those struggling with histamine overload. Collagen, collagen-rich sources, gelatin, and protein powders are all naturally high in histamines. If you find that you are triggered by high histamine foods or barely get relief after taking one or more antihistamines daily, you probably want to avoid collagen. Some of my clients, especially those dealing with histamine-triggered eczema, rosacea, and chronic hives, need to reduce their exposure to dietary histamines while working on other histamine triggers like gut dysbiosis, estrogen dominance, poor DAO production, or mold exposure. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can't ever enjoy bone broth or add a collagen peptide supplement to your daily life, but until you've resolved what's driving histamine levels higher, adding collagen will likely make things worse. I've got a bunch of resources for you over at skinterrupt.com forward slash 184, as well as articles for you to dive deeper on this topic. Head there to check them out and to leave your thoughts and questions as well. So if you found this episode insightful, I ask that you share this information with someone you know who could benefit from adding collagen into their regimen or equally someone who probably should be avoiding it due to their histamine issues. Sharing is crucial for our community to become more informed so that everyone can make the best possible decisions to support their health and skin. And before you head off for your day, take a moment to rate and review the Healthy Skin Show on your podcast platform. Make sure to hit that subscribe button so you can tune in each week for new research, tips, and inspiration. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.